We offered it online and offer it in person. The peace of Christ be with you. And also with you. Amen. It is a blessing to be able to be together. Today's scripture picks up also in the Gospel of John. We have been journeying and moving through this journey over Lent, this very peculiar Lent. Someone wrote, this is the Lentiest Lent we have ever imagined. <laughs> we are giving up way more than we could have imagined. And yet we are here. Next Sunday begins Holy Week. It is incredible. This way of the Christ, way and journey towards the cross has been our theme. It's been our theme as we have wandered and listened to where Jesus is each of these passages. We started off with the wilderness. There we discussed Christ temptation by Satan and the ways in which temptation comes to us often when we are most weak, most vulnerable. We looked at what it meant for the way of Christ to be one of wondering as Nicodemus came and wondered about this Jesus, wondered what it might mean to be born again, born from above, born once more, wondering ourselves what it might mean to step out of the shadows and further into the light of our calling to follow Jesus. And last week, we talked about witnessing as we witnessed and watched the man born blind be healed not for the sake of his own self alone, but so that the crowds too could be transformed by what they witnessed in their journeying, in their seeing, in their acknowledging this Jesus Christ. Today we finish the way of the Christ as weeping. I'm going to ask the question, and I know you can't answer it live, but I invite you into a space to remember when is the last time you weeped? I mean, really, truly weeped. I want you to think about that for just a few seconds. For your weeping, we light a tear, we light a flame. For your weeping, 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 we light a flame. For 
over your weeping. We light a flame. For your weeping, we light a flame. Again, for your weeping, we light a flame. Michelle, for your weeping, we light a flame. When you think about the last time you wept, were you alone? Were others there? Weeping is a vulnerable action. Novelist Sarah Hockler writes in her novel, 20 Boys Summer, weeping is not the same thing as crying. It takes your whole body to weep. And when it's over, you feel like you don't have any bones left to hold you up. There is something cathartic about a good cry. There is something beautiful about being free enough to feel the fullness of one's emotions, and this includes weeping. And yet and still, we live in a world in which tears can be misconstrued as weaknesses by some people. And tears can be used to control and manipulate by some people. Yet it is one of the most authentic and holy forms of feeling that happens when we weep. It is an embodied reflection of deep empathy, deep feeling, and compassion towards others and ourselves. Our scripture today is a journey with Christ through this empathy, this, a journey through Christ of feeling and compassion. And in these days when we are quarantined, and in these days when we are required to stay at home, our local officials have declared it so, our state officials have declared it so. In these days, knowing that God declares that we can still feel and have empathy and compassion beyond any physical walls that may be between us, beyond any walls of division that may be between us. We can be creative in our compassion and intentional in the ways in which we are called to be vulnerable, called to have courage, even to the point of weeping. Last week I mentioned that the lectionary text was a whole chapter. And I did not expect to go through it, but as the week went on, it felt like there were no verses that needed to be cut out. This week's scripture, kind of similar, although it's not the whole chapter. I had planned just to use a little snippet, but verses 1 through 45 actually tell the full of the story. So my goal, my hope is that we can traverse this passage, and I will point you a few things that scholars have offered that can help us make it real for us in these days. The scripture begins, verse 1 of John 11. Please feel free to follow along with me. Now a certain man was sick, Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who had anointed the Lord with fragrant oil and wiped her feet with his hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore the sisters went to him that is Christ, and said, Lord, behold, he whom you love is sick. Lazarus, 
similar to last week's story, is identified as someone who is going through a trial, going through his struggle. But in this case, we don't only identify him as someone who is sick, but also someone who is within a community, someone who is within a family, someone who is within a family that is faithful in their closeness to Jesus. So often, as is the case, as we mentioned last week, we stop at that first descriptor. We stop at what is someone's issue. The invitation with Lazarus and with last week's story is to know that a part of walking like Christ, walking with Christ, is to see people more fully. It's interesting here that there is a distinction that each of these three people are known by Christ. Lazarus, unlike others in the scripture, isn't cared for because he's related to someone. The scripture says, the one that you love, not even having to say by name when his sister came, that is the one who was ill and Jesus knew who it was. Jesus didn't simply love the family as a unit. But Jesus loved them each as individuals. He loved Martha, he loved Mary, and he loved Lazarus. This individual love that Christ has for each is beautiful and significant. Oftentimes we are called or feel one or the other. Either it's me and Jesus and whatever to the rest of the world, or Jesus loves us, but we never get to the fact that Jesus loves me. And Jesus loves you. All of this is true. The disciple that Jesus loved, there is one that is referred to as the beloved disciple. That's actually the writer of this gospel, John. And it's amazing that he's not threatened that this is how he describes the relationship. The beloved disciple knows that there's enough love from Jesus to go around. Siblings, in this day, may we remember this good news. God loves us, and there is no need for jealousy. The scripture continues. that Jesus stayed for two more days. It is interesting, truly interesting, that Jesus does not immediately move. This brings about a bit of anxiety for us often when we hear that part of the scripture. I can only imagine the fervor for which Mary runs and says, Lord, behold, the one whom you love is sick. And I can only imagine that she thought, let's get going, Jesus. But instead, it says he stays for two more days. And it seems so strange. But it's amazing. Because in fact, we'll discover that in that current moment when she's arrived, Lazarus is actually already dead. And Jesus is timing, deliberate, not rushed by humanity, will be right on time. Jesus can at times continue to feel this way with our relationship with God, that we want God to hurry up and fix it. It'd be great if Corona was over tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Let the people cry out for it. But God's timing is God's timing and Man, does it make us clear that we're not God. There is an invitation to 
humility in this passage. It says, then he said to his disciples, let's go to Judea again. This is picking up in verse 7. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, lately the Jews, they sought to stone you, and you are going to go there again? Hmm. Jesus answered, are there not 12 hours in the day, this riddle that will open up together? If only, if anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if one walks at night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. I can only imagine the disciples once again going, huh? Not only are you saying you want to return to the place in which they have vowed to kill you by stoning you, you give us a riddle, a puzzle to figure out? What is this 12 days and 12 hours in a day? And what does it have to do whether or not you should go to the place where they're calling to stone you? Jesus is offering us a still mysterious riddle that slows us down in the middle. 12 hours. The time when he was called to be here. He was called to do everything in that time. The time that we are called to be here on this earth, we too are called to do everything in that time. For indeed, there are other times when you just can't. When the darkness, the uncertainty, the chaos stops it all. We are called to do what we can do while we do it. And we see this as the way in which Christ does out of compassion. He moves, maybe not in the timing that Mary and Martha would have preferred, and certainly not in the direction that the disciples desired. But Jesus moves and calls us, shows us that we can too. It says again, he stayed for two more days and this seems strange to us. It is clear that it prolonged the sorrow of Mary and Martha, but in these two days of agonizing grief for them, Jesus is able to even more show the glory of God. It was within a Hebrew tradition to believe that the body and the spirit separated at the time of death. But there were three days in which that body could return. It would hover in that space. And so this waiting, waiting was a sign of just how big of a miracle was to take place. It is clear that sometimes waiting, oh God, it is hard. Waiting alone can cause us to weep, amen? There are times, dear ones, siblings, when we are called to wait and we don't want to. We're afraid that we may go under. It may be the end. It may never happen. It may only be despair, but all we can do is wait and weep. And that is not unfaithful. To be clear, that is faithful at times. Through his actions, Jesus displays that God's delay is not God's denial. That God's timing is just that, God's timing alone. 
And what feels like eternity for us is no time at all for God. And what God does not desire, our pain. God does not need us to feel pain. This life is not called to be one without it. The invitation is to know that God is always with us in it. Jesus courageously decides to go to Judea and Jerusalem. And discovers there, speaks to the disciples in a way that has them a little bit baffled as to why they even should go that way. They wonder, initially, Jesus says, our friend, our friend has fallen asleep. And the disciples think quite literally, okay, well then we are not in a rush to go to the place where they may stone us because we've fallen asleep, we will be okay. And then Jesus does what Jesus can do for us, makes it even more plain what it is. No, it is not that he has merely fallen asleep. But that Lazarus, that Lazarus is dead. Lazarus is dead. And this is puzzling to hear the Lord say, and I am glad for your sake that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I'm not there, so that you may believe. I am introduced to the session and uh, shared at the Elder Symposium the power of impact statements. And I share this because our motto here at Meadow Lake Church is small church, big impact. An impact statement helps us to have clarity as to what it is we are doing. So I've invited our session members and all of our leaders to think, what's the impact of your ministry? You do this ministry so that this can happen. It may look strange that this is happening if you don't know why it's happening. Jesus gives an amazing so that statement so that it is clear it is not happening because I am harsh. It is not happening because I don't care. It is not happening for any other reason but that we may have more belief, that there may be more believing in who God is and what God can do. It's still hard to hear, amen? Even if you know that, there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that can separate us from the love of Jesus Christ, and yet, life can be difficult. But the fact that Jesus is willing to share with compassion that I'm not doing this out of hardness, I'm not doing it out of anything other than to bring your relationship closer to God. There is compassion and there is empathy that is driving Jesus' action. So when Jesus came, it says, oh, oh, one thing I want to share. Thomas the twin. People oftentimes wonder, why is he called Thomas the twin? So in Hebrew, and in, uh, in, at the time when Jesus was alive, everyone, every Jewish person had two names. They had a Hebrew name and they had a Greek name. So his Hebrew name was Thomas. His Greek name was Didymus, which meant twin. And it is believed that of all the disciples, he looked the most like Jesus. People would confuse them and think that he was Jesus. Therefore, you can really understand why Thomas is wondering, why do we need to go back to that place? 
where I might get confused to you, but you also see the closeness that Thomas has with Christ, that once it is explained, once it is made clear that this is to glorify God, that this is that you may believe even more, Thomas's bold faith changes, and he says to his fellow disciples, then let us also go that we may die with him, that is Christ. Let us go that we may die with him. That kind of devotion, that kind of compassion. That kind of love. Could leave one to weep. Jesus then came, it says in verse 17. He found that the tomb, he had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And many of the Jews who had joined Mary and Martha to comfort them while they were concerned, concern, comfort them with their concern for their brother, then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming she then went and she met him but mary was sitting at the house and martha said lord lord if you had been here my brother would not have died but even now i know that whatever you ask of god god will give you Four days he had been in the tomb. Nothing had ever been shown to believe that one could live and be arisen past that. Four days. Four days, a procession comprised of relatives and friends and hard time, those who came, who were hired mourners even, came to the graveside and mourned and cried and wept and sat and prayed. And when I think about the fact that right now, I see testimony of testimony of folks who just cannot, because of where we are in the world, sit next to their loved ones, just to hold their hand. It's enough to make you weep. Sitting at the house, sitting at the house, This oftentimes uh, reminds folks of the earlier Mary and Martha story of one being the doer and one being the sitter. Mary sits. There's a belief that in the midst of such travesty, in the Hebrew tradition, there was an understanding that grief was not a head experience as we often expect it to be in our American society, but grief was a whole body experience. And there was times in which one just had to sit because the body could do no more. She sits. And in that space, griefs, just as she is called to with her community around her, But yet we hear the words of Martha. You hear her saying, Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have died. But yet even now, I know that whatever you ask is possible. And then Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha said, knowing and believing Beyond the, there was a Pharisees and the Sadducees had this kind of a, a, a tip over what happens after death. And the Pharisees believed that one would rise again at 
the appointed time. And so Martha recognized what was true and says, yes, I know he will rise again at the resurrection on the last day. But Jesus says to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He doesn't say, I will teach you about resurrection and life. He doesn't say, I will be some resurrection or life or I will point to you. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. And those who believe in me, they will not die. They shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. And then... He invites Martha into a space of accepting. Do you believe this? And in that moment, in the middle of her real grief, she has to decide, what do I believe? And she says, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the anointed one. You are the one who has been sent, the son of God who has come into the world. I am the resurrection and the life. Apart from me, there is neither resurrection nor life. But with me, new life is possible Oh, great goodness. What a blessing to know that in Christ there is new life possible. When we come to this table in a moment, when we break bread, we will remember that even that life was broken for us and that with that life, new life was made possible, resurrection for all. But Martha doesn't have access to this table quite yet in the same way. She doesn't know it in the same way. She has to believe in the moment that Jesus is offering words that she cannot even fathom. And when she said this thing, she went away and secretly she called her sister, it says in verse 28. The teacher has come and is calling for you, he, she says to Mary. As soon as Mary heard that, she arose and quickly came to him. See, there's something about knowing that Jesus is calling your name in the midst of your storm that can get you moving when you don't think that you can. Then the Jews who were in her house and comforting her they rose up quickly and they went out following her. They assumed that, oh, she must be getting up to go to the tomb to weep. And then Mary came and saw him. She fell down to her feet and said to him words that sound familiar. Lord, if you had been there, my brother would not have been dead. This says to me that Mary and Martha in the middle of their distress had been talking. What could have been different? What would have been different? Y'all know that kind of weeping, right? When you're in the middle of what could have been a different way? What might have changed everything? And what they knew consistently is that Jesus would have made a difference if he was there. Verse 33. Therefore, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. And he said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. I find this remarkable that the Lord chose to be so true and honest of his humanity that the one who knows all needed compassionate people to lead him to where he needed to go. Come, Lord, come and see. And in that, that invitation, at that moment, Jesus wept. With compassion and a care for those who were around him who were 
heartbroken. And then the Jews said, see how Jesus, he loved him. And some of them said, this cannot, could not this man who opened the eyes of the blind, that is the story that we offered last week, open the eyes of the blind, also have kept this one from dying. Then Jesus again groaned in himself and came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. A couple things. I just want you all to know how powerful it is to know that Jesus, God incarnate, sees our tears, hears our tears, hears our weeping, is touched by our tears, acts to change the situation in compassion for our tears. Know that your weeping is not in vain, that your weeping is a prayer, that your weeping speaks to God. No matter who or how or where you've heard, there could be mocking of tears. This is particularly true to our men, men, siblings, brothers, Jesus wept. Your manhood is not tied around your inability to feel. A part of that makes you a human, a man, is that you can feel. The Jews who came along were weeping. Jesus was weeping. He saw and then he wept. The verb that is used here twice that says groaned is an unusual verb. It's that it's actually only used in other places to describe the sound a horse makes, that sound. There is angst and anger and, and, and upsetness of how much pain can be caused by death. And Jesus responds this way out of empathy and compassion. The word wept that is used for Jesus is a different word than the weeping that happened earlier. The weeping that happens earlier for Mary and uh, Martha as well as the Jews, there is a weeping that is a wailing. The kind of weeping that Jesus does is the kind in which tears fall in a stream. No sound. That kind of pouring out that happens in that space. Verse 41 picks up. Then they took away the stone, the place where the dead man was lying. I want to note here that the day that took away the stone that that day, um, that that day was Mary and Martha. Jesus declared and asked that the stone be taken away and they were concerned about the stench. They were concerned. He's been in there, Lord, for four days. And Martha said, Lord, by the time of this, there is a stench. There is a stench from being dead for four days. And Jesus said, did not I say, do you believe so that you may see the glory of God. I once had a, a raccoon die in our band room rafters. <laughs> it only took one day <laughs> of that stench for everyone to know that something was wrong. But fearlessly, And compassionately, 
Jesus asked them to go through the stench to see the glory of God. Another interesting thing about stench and smell is that that is the sense that is most tied to memory. So consistently, the smell of death would be a reminder of what was taking place in this moment. The scripture closes, our passage closes with this. Then they took away the stone from the place where the man had been lying, and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me, but I say it because of the people who are standing by. I say this, that they may believe that you sent me. Those who were with us last week remember those same Jews, that group of Pharisees and the wider community were questioning, is this person from God or is he a sinner? And Jesus is trying his best to make it clear and to witness to everyone, for your sake I speak out and say thank you with gratitude, already knowing what God is capable of doing. Siblings, in the midst of our situations where we may too be weeping, I invite you into the spiritual place of in advance saying thank you for God for moving, for doing, for changing in the ways that offer more wholeness. Right in the middle of your situation, to do so is to step into your prophetic identity. It is to step into your place as one who walks the way of Christ. Then he took the stone from the place where it was laying. Jesus gave her a promise and he offered his attention to her and had her confess her faith. And then she was invited to be a part of that act of faith in the moving of the stone, even when she wasn't sure it was going to make a difference. And when these things had been done, he cried out in a loud voice, not because the strength of his voice is what mattered, because I'm certain if he would have whispered, the same thing would have happened, but it was so that those around could hear Lazarus come forth. And he who had died came up bound hand and foot in his grave clothes. His face was wrapped with cloth, and Jesus said to those there, loose him and let him go. He cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. Simply, a direct imperative, Lazarus, come forth. Be directed by me in the midst of death. Be directed by me. Hear my voice. Be my sheep. Come when I call, Lazarus, come forth. Praise be to God when we can listen to Jesus' call to come forth, even when death is all around us, even when the situation looks most bleak. It's interesting here that Lazarus comes out, and I want to make a good distinction between the difference between being resurrected and resuscitated. What we experience here with Lazarus is a resuscitation, a brought back to lifeness. It is unique at this table that we will break bread, that we celebrate the resurrection, and that we celebrate it in two weeks on Easter. Jesus came out of his grave clothes. They were left behind in the tomb. Lazarus comes back in himself with those same clothes on because at some point, Lazarus will die again. Jesus is offering to us a reminder that life is full of miracles, and yet the bigger promise is that resurrection and new life is possible through Christ for the ongoing. They took away the stone. They saw him come out. They saw Jesus give thanks and praise. One who had been moved to weeping. Said, so then 
many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things that Jesus did believed in him. The compassion of our Lord and Savior, even when we are the hardest to convince, to weep on our behalf, to heal on our behalf, to bring wholeness on behalf is extraordinary. And so we praise be to that God both this day and always. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.